All right, statistics people, I wanted to do a review for your second exam, but I didn't want to wait till Thursday's class to do it, so that way you'd have an opportunity to view it a couple days before you took the exam at least. So I figured a video is the best way to go. So here goes. Your exam is this week. It is October 7th and 8th, which is Friday and Saturday. It begins at 12.01 a.m., so very late Thursday night. As Thursday night rolls into Friday morning, the exam opens, and you have until Saturday at 11.59 p.m. to finish it. So not quite, but almost 48-hour window to carve out 75 minutes worth of time to take the exam. Um, as we have way too much knowledge of, storms can be really bad, so don't wait until the last minute and run into any kind of power issues. So uh, take it earlier as opposed to later. That way you won't run into any trouble. Now, as far as the exam itself, it's a lot like exam one. There's no proctoring software being used, no honor lock uh, for exam two. Um, I do have the right to pull that out for exam three. The best way you can avoid that is just work on your own. I don't want any hint of you working with anyone else on this exam. And people tend to talk, and it usually gets back to me. So work on your own. You have open books, notes. Uh, you can Google stuff as long as you're not talking to another person. And that means talking or communicating with another person. Don't send text messages, for instance. But if you want to Google normal distribution, that's fine. Um, just remember that in an uh, open book exam, if you're trying to look up the answer for every single problem, you can run out of time pretty quickly. So there are 16 questions. I'd say work as many as you can without any help, any books, any notes, any Googling, um, and then go back to the ones that you have trouble with and, and research them a little bit. But the questions are two or three points each that total 40 points. The topics, uh, let's start with... I'll scroll down here. At least I think I'll scroll down here. Let's start with uh, random variables and probability distribution. Random variables are the X's. So when you talk about the number of the students that have a tattoo, that's going to be an X. It's either going to be zero or one or two. And the jumping nature of that X makes it a discrete random variable. The amount of time it takes me to drive from home to USF, whether it takes me 24 minutes or 24 and a half or 24 and a third, the fact that it doesn't jump from one value to the next makes that a continuous random variable. You should know the difference. The random variable sets up the value of x. The probability distribution starts assigning probabilities to those values of x. So we saw with discrete random variables, there's two rules that probability distributions follow. Probabilities have to be between 0 and 1. And when you sum up all those probabilities, they have to sum to 1. When we're working with continuous distributions, that summing to 1 idea really was uh, that the area under the curve was one. So area is probability when you're working with those continuous curves. For discrete distributions, there's a little formula to see there for the expected value of x, or another way we could say that the mean of the x's, take the sum of the x's times the probabilities. You don't do it often, but there will be one problem on the exam where I give you a little probability table and ask you to go through this formula. Um, I'd recommend practicing either with a sample exam or some homework problems. If you go to the homework problems, however, all these problems are going to ask you to find the mean and the variance. Please ignore the variance. I'm not going to ask you to do that for discrete distributions. Uh, the one main discrete probability distribution that we looked at was the binomial. And there's going to be several binomial questions, so make sure you're really, really good at it. First thing is you need to know the conditions or the criteria necessary for a binomial. There are four things. First, you've taken a sample from a population. The sample size is n, and we usually think about having n experimental units, or we've done n trials from the population. That's the first condition. The second is for each of those trials or experimental units, there's two and only two outcomes. We call them success and failure that we get to define. The third condition is that the probability of success is p, the probability of a failure is q. Now, typically, I only need to tell you one of those two probabilities because I have to sum to one. So if I tell you 70% of the students have uh, have, let's say I talk about 70% of the students lost power during the hurricane. That's P, 30% did That's Q. Um, so I only have to give you one of those probabilities. Uh, the fourth condition uh, is that the trials are independent of one another. In the example I just used, this may not be true. So if I look at one student, whether they lost power or not would have to be independent of whether another student lost power or not, which if the two students are roommates, that obviously wouldn't be the case. So the whether you lost power or not during the hurricane would probably not meet the conditions of the binomial. But as long as those four conditions, there's an N, there's two outcomes, the probability of success is P, the outcomes are independent of one another, then you have the binomial. Um, the mean of a binomial, you saw the mean up above for the discrete random variable, it simplifies. For the binomial, it's just N times P. 
I mentioned I don't want you using the variance formula for a discrete distribution. If it's a binomial, the variance is n times p times q. The standard deviation is the square root of n times p times q. So the values of the mean and standard deviation get simple when we know that we're working with a binomial. Uh, the other thing I'm going to ask you to do with binomials is solve probabilities. I spent a fair amount of time, this is a couple weeks ago now, but I spent a fair amount of time going through the cumulative binomial tables, the less than or equal to tables, and I drew some dots. And remember the Dumbledinger dot diagram? Ah, what fun we had. Uh, but you should be really, really proficient at solving binomial probabilities, and so make sure that you're really good at it before you take your exam. Oops. Uh, let's come down here a little further. The normal distribution is our continuous distribution that we're working with. And there are many different normal curves. The first one we look at is a Z distribution, but we do that primarily so that we understand how to solve Z distribution or, or standard normal distribution probabilities. And the reason that we do that is because all other normal distributions can be made to look like or behave like the standard normal. So when I tell you the, the mean is 75 and the standard deviation is 10 from some normal curve, the way that we solve that is to create z-scores and use the z-distribution. There are two main z-tables. The one we're using I refer to as the inside table or inside probability table. There's also a cumulative table. Now, I didn't show you that one. It works fine, um, and I don't really care which one you use. However, everything I did in class, all the different normal tables that I've littered throughout Canvas are going to be those inside probability tables. So that's you're going to, you're going to see examples of me solving things that way. Um, just something to be careful about if you start Googling solving normals. It may look a little different than our table. Um, the two main types of questions that you're going to be working with with normal probabilities uh, or normal distributions are the probability type problems, where if the mean is 75 and the standard deviation is 10, I might ask you, what's the chance the, the values of x are less than 76 or between 72 and 78? Um, so I give you values of x and ask you for the probabilities, and then the other type of problem is the find the point in the distribution type problem where I give you a percentage or a probability and ask you to find the value of x where that occurs. So I might ask you to find the top 10% or the bottom 6%. Um, both problems are pretty common with normal distributions. You're going to see both on the exam. And again, you should probably practice them quite a bit. Uh, the other topic that we did in chapter four was assessing normality. I gave you four different techniques for assessing the normality of um, a data set. One is to look at chapter two plots like stem and leaf displays and histograms and, and see. Second is to do what I call an empirical analysis where you check to see if the empirical rule percentages of 68, 95, and 100 percent apply to your data set. Uh, the third was to take a, the third was a weird one, you take the interquartile range divided by the standard deviation. Um, normal distributions tend to have a value close to 1.3, weird, right? But that was our third technique. And then the fourth one was a normal probability plot, which was kind of a new idea. A simple plot to get, and we're just looking to see how straight the line is. The normal probability plot, the straighter the plot, the more normal the data. And that was our chapter four work. When we moved to chapter five, and that's this week's work, um, and so it got postponed because of the hurricane, but we talked about sampling distribution. And you should have a general sense of what a sampling distribution is. And I talked about kind of four pieces. Take a sample calculate a statistic, which you guys have been doing with your projects, as I mentioned in class this week. Um, and then the sampling distribution says do it again, and again, and again, and again, repeatedly sample. And then the fourth thing says take all those different X bars that you created from all those repeated samples and kind of plot them. Put them on a number line and see what it looks like. And that piling up or that accumulation of all those sample means or sample proportions or sample statistics in general is referred to as the sampling distribution. And then specifically, I spent some time this week looking at, or depending on when you're watching this, I will spend some time this week working with the sampling distribution of X-bar and doing some probability work. So you should be able to describe the sampling distribution of X-bar to me, and then you should be able to work some probability problems for me. And a couple of good examples of this would be your projects in question 2C and 2D. I ask you to do this work for me. And then uh, competency check six which isn't due until Monday the, what is that going to be, the 9th of October. And I've already told you that even though I'm, I'm showing you the questions and it's saying it's due on the 9th of October, um, everyone's going to get full credit for this particular competency check. And that's just because of the delay and Hurricane Ian and all that fun stuff. Uh, so those are the questions, 16 questions over those topics. Uh, you can see I have sample exam for module two. Look at that clever name, practice exam for module two. And I've created some videos uh, showing you how to get the answer. So that's a good way of reviewing 
the material that uh, you're responsible for on this exam. So I wanted to give you a video. Um, hopefully you have a little bit of time to go over this. The TAs are going to be in the office this week up through Thursday. So when you get questions, go ahead and ask. But uh, good luck on the exam this week, folks. See ya.